Thank you, Lars. Good morning, everybody. As, uh, as Lars explained to you, and I don't understand a word of Danish, but I can understand photographs, uh, he shared with you that 2011 is a very important year for IBM because we turned 100 years this year. And uh, we started three or four years ago planning our centennial. And from the start, we did not want our 100th anniversary to be merely a celebration or a party or things like that. We wanted to use our history as an opportunity to learn. And we've learned many things, and we've shared our learnings with our clients and with the industry and with others, because there's a lot to be learned from a 100-year-old company that has gone through 100 years of change. As I think you know, and you saw some from the photographs in Lars' presentations, uh, IBM started off 100 years ago making things like clocks and scales and, uh, and uh, meat, meat cutters and things like that. And of course, since then, we've made many things, from typewriters to punch uh, card machines and big calculators powered by vacuum tubes, to today with things like Watson and business software analytics and so forth. So the history of IBM teaches us not only about longevity, being old, but about how to change. And it, changes, it teaches us one other thing that I'd like to share with you very specifically because it relates to your whole day here about uh, smarter business. And that there is a difference between serving a market, as we all do, and occasionally the opportunity comes to make a market. From serving a market that exists to making a market, to creating a market. And when we look across our history, uh, and we're not unique in this, but when we look across IBM's history and the history of the IT industry, we see several occasions when IBM, in partnership with our clients and others, made a market. And uh, let, let me give you a few examples of this. So uh, this is the punch card, of course. And uh, the company really made its early success on the basis of the punch card tabulator. Now, we may look at a piece of paper with little holes in it and say, well, that doesn't seem like very advanced technology. But in its day, this was high tech. This was uh, very innovative. And there were intense competitive battles and big breakthroughs in punch card technology. Let me give you an example. So at, at one point, out of the laboratories of IBM, we introduced a revolution in punch card technology. We went from the 40-column punch card to the 80-column punch card. <laughs> and we were very proud of that. But our number one competitor at the time, a company called Remington Rand, battled back with its own revolution, the 90-column punch card. And the industry was being driven by advances in the punch card tabulator. Well, the real revolution came not from IBM or from Remington Rand or any other technology company. The revolution came because of what was happening with our customers, all of our customers. You see, at, uh, by the 1930s, customers were choking on paper punch cards. By 1937, they were consuming between 5 and 10 million punch cards every day. Now, for IBM and our, and our other companies in the IT industry, this was really good news. Uh, because by that same time, one-third of IBM's profits came from the manufacturing and sale of the paper punch card, just the cards, a third of our profits. So it was not in the interests of the industry to leave this technology behind. But the customer was becoming unhappy because of just the huge amount of paper they had to buy and store. In fact, in the 1930s, when all those skyscrapers were going up in New York City, many of our customers were saying they had to devote entire floors of their new buildings to cabinets to store all of this paper. Why? Well, it was because it was their vital business data. The breakthrough came not from an engineer or a scientist, but it came from an unexpected source. You remember the entertainer, Bing Crosby? Yeah. Well, Bing Crosby was uh, 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 at the peak of his popularity in the 1930s. Among other things, he had a weekly radio show. And Bing Crosby was getting tired of having to go to the studio every week and broadcasting his songs live. And so he challenged the radio network 
isn't there some way of you sort of recording my voice and then broadcasting that, you know, so I don't have to be there? And they found out a way of recording Bing Crosby's show on plastic tape. And because this had never been done before, it was big news. And for the first time in history, a, a radio show was broadcast that was pre recorded. Well, a small team of engineers at IBM's laboratory in New York, of course, heard about this big news. And they asked themselves would it be possible to store business data? On plastic tape instead of the punch card. And so they started some experiments to,、uh, to record data on tape. They were making good progress. And some big corporate person came down one day and reminded them well, it's nice that you're fooling around with this plastic tape thing, but don't forget that the IBM company was built on paper punch cards, and it will always be a paper punch card business. Typical corporate headquarters helpfulness there, right? Well, you know how the story ends. You know,、uh, IBM was one of the first companies to commercialize magnetic tape, and we said goodbye over time to the punch card tabulator, a big breakthrough. And to give you an idea, one reel of magnetic tape, one reel could hold the equivalent of 35,000 punch cards. One reel, 35,000 cards. Now, you would think that given our customers' complaints about the cards, this would be an overnight sensation. But this is the first lesson of making a market and how that's different from simply introducing a new product or technology. As, as excited as we were, and as excited as the customer was to have a new technology that was much more efficient, customers were concerned. As one customer put it when talking to an IBM salesperson, you know, I can not only see my data in the punch card, I can feel my data in the punch card. And with this plastic tape thing, I can't do either. So the customer didn't trust the new technology. So, one of the lessons we've learned as we make a market, I mean, as an industry, as users of technology, all of us, is that sometimes we have to overcome this, this confidence issue trust in a new solution, not just a new product. Now,、uh, when we look across our, our history and other aspects of making a market, you know, we went from being in one country, of course, the United States, to today operating in more than 170. So we know how to make a market geographically, but sometimes we forget what that really means. When we look through the archives of IBM and when we established business for the first time in parts of Europe and parts of Latin America and parts of Asia, It's interesting what were in the archives in terms of the photographs to record the day we entered, for example, the Philippines. This is 1961. And I want to show you a few of the photographs from our archives. This is the Philippines, 1961. This is Thailand, Thailand 1963.、Uh, this is,、um, uh, I think, this is Nigeria, yes, 1965. And I can go on and on. Now, even though I've showed you just a few photographs here, what strikes you about the photographs that were in our archives? You see,、uh, they aren't photographs of new buildings and, and ribbon cutting ceremonies.、Uh, most of the photographs that we found in our archives of our going to one country after another were of classrooms. The photographs are of people in classrooms. Some of them are new IBMers. Many more of them, though, are people who are first time users of data processing technology. The first time they've, they've encountered technology. And what are they being taught? They're not being taught about IBM products. They're being taught a new language, basically, the new language of information technology or of finance or how to manage technology,、uh, how, how to apply technology in their enterprises. And, and so we learn that sometimes making markets requires education, not about engineering and all of that, but teaching people a new curriculum. And、uh, it's a very important lesson that we think about、uh, what we're, what we're,、uh, the time that we're living in today. If we,、uh, if we jump forward to this day, this is an important day in,、uh, in technology history. This is April 7th, 1964. 
This man is Tom Watson, Jr. He is the second CEO of IBM and the son of the founder of IBM, Tom Watson, Sr. This day, he's announcing the IBM System 360, the mainframe. Now, on this day, at this moment, he's announcing the System 360, which is six processors in a family, 40 peripheral devices, and it's the first time the uh, information technology world heard terms like backward and forward compatibility and uh, scalability. And it was the first time that a computer had the 8-bit byte. But something else was happening this day, because with this one announcement, IBM immediately cannibalized all of our existing product lines. Because who wanted to have a 701 or a 1400 system when you could have a System 360 with all of these great benefits? Unfortunately, we could not ship the System 360 for several years. <laughs> because the technology was so advanced, we didn't know how to produce it in volume and quality. And so we had promised the market this vision of this brand new uh, product family, but we struggled to deliver it. In fact, it set off a civil war inside of IBM as one executive team after another came and went to try to deliver System 360, including Tom's own brother, younger brother Arthur. He didn't, he didn't make it, by the way. System 360 cost the equivalent in R&D, today's dollars, of $34 billion, the largest private R&D project in history. Even today, $34 billion. Yes, you know, if you were the CEO, you, you had days like this. And after several years, we were able to finally deliver System 360. And you have pictures like this, you know, it was the first time you had the modern data center and everything worked well together. But again, we learned a lesson about making markets because System 360, by its very name, was the first time the industry thought about systems instead of computers. It thought about systems, not about machines. And again, the customers, as much as they wanted the advantages of a more powerful computer, they weren't too sure what to do with a system thought. And so in partnership with some forward-thinking clients, we began to pioneer new applications of a system to systemic transformation. And one of the ones that we would all recognize was the, uh, uh, the development of our online transaction processing. This happens to be airline reservation systems, which we take for granted today. But at that time, it was still batch processing, overnight processing. And with American Airlines, we pioneered this uh, new way of having a system that would operate in more or less real time. So the lesson from this example was that sometimes making a market requires systemic change, not just a new computer system, but systemic change in a company or in an industry. The final example comes from a very famous moment in world history, and we're, we're all very proud of this, and we're proud of IBM's contribution to it. I saw it in Lars' presentation. Yes, uh, our partnership with NASA on its uh, moon missions from the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Now, what's not often known is that we, we were asked by NASA to build uh, four special System 360s for the Apollo missions, both on-the-ground systems to control the spacecraft, but also onboard systems in the, uh, in the Apollo spacecraft themselves. And I'd like to share with you a little insight, because it speaks about making markets, about the day when the Apollo 11 craft actually landed on the surface of the moon. Now, uh, the day was July 20th, 1969. The Apollo 11 had made it into orbit, around the moon, it had been orbiting for four days. And in the control room in Houston, you had, of course, NASA engineers, but side by side, you had IBM specialists monitoring and controlling this very important day when they would attempt for the first time a landing of a human being on the moon. And after checking all of the systems, Houston gave the go-ahead to attempt a landing on the surface of the moon. 
This is the video footage of the lunar landing module leaving the command module. And in that lunar landing module, as you will remember, you had two men, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And the spacecraft is moving away from the command module, and everything is working well. But this is technology, after all. <laughs> and uh, on their way down, as they're getting closer and closer to the surface of the moon, and all systems are go, all systems are nominal, something happens. And I'm going to show that to you, and it isn't often seen. Program alarm. The 12.02. 12.02. 12.02 alarm goes off in a lunar landing module. What you heard there is the conversation between Neil Armstrong in the lunar landing module controlling the, the craft and Houston confirming the 1202 alarm is going off. The 1202 alarm uh, signals when the onboard computer is being overloaded by data. There is so much data coming in from the spacecraft, the computer cannot keep up with it. So the alarm goes off. Now, uh, Houston, of course, knowing what might happen with the 1202 alarm, uh, says proceed. And they continue down closer and closer to the surface of the moon. And then this happens. Time alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201. The 12 alarm, uh, one alarm is more urgent. It's more critical because the 1201 alarm signals that the onboard computer might shut down. There is no control alt delete. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you've ever been in the cockpit of an airplane, uh, now is not the time to start shouting at the pilot as he's about to land the airplane, right? So uh, a lot of things happen now very, very quickly. You have two alarms going off, one more critical than the other. Now, interestingly, the last simulation that occurred before the spacecraft went up, these two alarms went off. And Houston gave the command to abort, to abort the mission. And Gene Krantz, the mission controller, if you saw the movie Apollo 13, he's the guy who says failure is not an option. Gene Krantz decides he has to sit there in Houston with these two alarms going off. Are they going to abort when they are about 400 feet from the surface of the moon? Well, the IBM engineer, after that simulation, went through the data. And even though they had called an abort, the IBM engineer said they shouldn't have aborted. The systems would have handled the data. They could have landed in that simulation. And so he says to mission control, it's OK. The systems are fine. Proceed. And Houston tells Neil Armstrong to proceed. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. 4.18 in the afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time. And a few hours later, after checking the systems again, Neil Armstrong was the first human being to land on the moon, despite the two alarms. What is a lesson here about making markets when you're pioneering something new? The lesson isn't that sometimes an alarm goes off. The lesson here is that collaboration matters. You see, if NASA had viewed IBM as a vendor with a product, they would never have been able, in that critical moment, make the decision and trust each other to proceed and history would not have been made that day. So very often, when we are making markets together, when we are trying something new together, there are risks, but that's when collaboration matters the most. Now, I, I mention all of this to you because there are interesting stories from our past, I mean our past, as people, and as people interested in technology, but I mention it now because we, together, at a very similar time, of making markets in the world. Uh, some of you might recognize what this is. This is the first transistor ever made, not by IBM, but by AT&T Bell Laboratories. And you know the transistor is, is the fundamental building block of all electronic devices, everything. And the reason why I show that to you today is that the transistor, this building block, is now available in such quantities and such economics that they're being sprinkled into everything. You see the economics here. 
And uh, we at IBM began to realize in 2008 that technology is going to be embedded into everything in the world, not just the things we would recognize as computers, you know, PCs and mainframes and Unix servers or smartphones even, that there would be the instrumentation of the planet, and by that we mean the infrastructure and the processes and systems that underpin how we live and how we work. And that these devices inside of roadways and power grids and all the rest would throw off data, tremendous amounts of data and new kinds of data, unstructured data, video, uh, blogs, social discussions. And that for the first time this would enable decision makers, whether they were heads of businesses or heads of cities, to see what was actually happening in their power grids, what was happening in their cities with traffic and with crime and with water, what was happening in natural systems as well. And that because we could see in real time, the, for often the first time, what was actually happening with our supply chains, with our markets, with our people, with our citizens, with our patients, we could make different kinds of decisions. We could improve these systems. We could make them smarter. This is a revolution. It doesn't have to come from IBM any more than putting technology into a spacecraft happened to come from IBM. It's just going to happen. The question is, how do we think about this moment together? So um, we have, in the past three years, starting in 2008, been having this dialogue with people, with you, with governments, with universities, about what we call Smarter Planet, but take, take the tagline out of it, this phenomenon of data coming up, uh, being instrument, instrumenting industries and companies, and then changing, driving transformation. And after three years, we have thousands of projects completed or underway, and we've learned a lot. A lot of this transformation is happening industry by industry, as you see here. But when you get inside of any particular industry, like healthcare, you find that the principles of instrumentation and interconnection and intelligence are changing things like electronic medical records or collaborative care or making possible health information exchanges. You get into a different industry, such as oil and gas, and you find different parts of that industry are transforming too through the same principles of capturing the data and then transforming a change or transforming a system. There are things that cut across industries horizontal transformations, too. One we're calling smarter commerce. You know, we thought about supply chain transformation and ERP systems for quite a while. Well, the other part of the corporation hasn't really gone through a similar transformation, and that's how we buy, market, sell, and service. But now technology is enabling us to do this kind of work very differently. And for people who have jobs like mine, uh, heads of marketing, CMOs, this is a new world. We all know that with, uh, with social media, for example, the human beings are all instrumented too, and from their smart devices, they're, they're telling us and telling everybody what they're doing, what they want, what they're seeking, what they desire. But we as corporations or as uh, leaders in government are not equipped to understand what's happening, what they're saying, and how to make sense of it and how to capitalize on it. So smarter commerce uh, describes that. So does social business not social media, but social business. And this is the application of the same phenomena of people uh, creating data. They're broadcasting, they're, they're, they're publishing, if you will, inside of companies, our workforces, extended enterprises with our supply chains and distributors, and yes, the entire market, the customers and, and others. What do we do with this data? How do we make sense of it? How do we capitalize on it? It's brand new, very different. And finally, as another example here, is the smarter city concept. You, you know that we're becoming, I mean, all of us as human beings, becoming more and more urbanized. And the future is going to be a planet of cities, some of them quite large, and in places that maybe we're not familiar with. But the city is a very fascinating way where a lot of these ideas of smarter planet transformation comes together. We've now completed or now engaged with 2,000 smarter city 
projects. And I want to share with you how they break out here. because You get a sense of where cities are applying uh, their investment and uh, their attention to transform the city. 26% of these 2,000 engagements, government services, citizen services. 11% smart transportation, so traffic, rail transport, and the like. 19% energy and water, smart grids, smart sewer management, smart water management. 5% public safety, for example, fighting crime with data, as they're doing in New York City, or preparing for emergency response, as they're doing in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, some social service, 9% education, a very large percentage, 20% for smarter health care. I gave you some examples of that, and other projects. But isn't it exciting to see that from a city standpoint, and we're one of the great cities of the world here uh, today, the transformation that is under, underway, maybe not in your city, but in, in thousands of cities today. It's very exciting. So, what do we learn from 100 years of corporate life? Well, we learn a lot. We learn a lot about going global, about what it means to be a company, what it means to be a global citizen, what it means to be an inventor. But as I've tried to share with you today, it also has taught us what it means to make a market. Not alone, not from a laboratory, but to make something new in the world that heretofore has never existed. What do we learn? It means that sometimes people worry about the future. And together we have to build confidence and trust in that future state. We learn that from the magnetic tape drive from the punch card example. We learn that often we have to teach ourselves a new vocabulary. Who talked about smart grids five years ago, or fighting crime with data, or lowering carbon through data and analytics? New vocabulary, new measurement. We learn that from going around the world making markets. We learn about systemic change with the System 360, applying technology, but more important than that, driving systemic transformation company by company, industry by industry. And from the Apollo missions, we learn that collaboration is vital. And that's the appropriate place to end here, I think, because of your day, uh, your day here on Smarter Business is all about collaborating with you, collaborating with us to build a smarter planet. We believe that the time to act is now, because so much is at stake, and the way to act is together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.